Sweet. All right. Well, welcome to the Mr. Bill podcast. I appreciate you taking the time to come on. Um, yeah, when your PR person hit me up, I was I was like, wait, what the fuck? Like, I've watched that movie before. Um, for those who don't know who you are, uh, you run a company now called Singular Sound, who makes a guitar pedal called the Beat Buddy. Um, yes. But before that, there was a you you lived a very different life, and it was like such an interesting mm. and strange uh sort of life that uh hollywood decided to make a film about you where jonah hill played like somebody and and i can't remember who the actor was who played you but yes miles teller plays right. me in the movie yeah. yeah 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 and yeah that movie is called war dogs and is about you and jonah hill or ephraim diveroli i think his name is yes. who basically sort of reconnect after high school at a funeral and then uh decide to go into selling ammunition and guns and, and whatnot to yeah. the to the US government. Um and then that obviously has a lot of uh crazy things happen in the process. So I, I have questions about both parts of your life, obviously. Like I'm interested yeah. in the music stuff as well. But mm -hmm. I also can't leave the fact that I also can't not talk about the war dog shit because it's sure. just like so interesting. And I know you're probably sick of talking about it. Like, nah, it's fine. It's listen. It's a, I understand. It's a, it's the hook and gets people to listen. And so uh, I make use of my interesting backstory to get on cool podcasts such as yours, and uh, <laughs> you know, gives me the uh, opportunity to promote my current business, which is uh, singular. As you mentioned, Singular Sound, and we make uh, uh, awesome. Uh, tech products for musicians um and uh, uh you know which i think your audience would be interested in so uh i think it's it's uh, it's a win for everybody I, I don't mind talking about it i would i would i would be surprised if if i'm not asked about it because it's uh, not every day you know that uh you meet somebody who has a a movie made about them and it was mm -hmm. definitely not something that i ever expected to happen in my life so it's uh still kind of weird for me Mm. well yeah. f first of all like big picture like how did you go from selling large amounts of weapons to the united states to yeah. making guitar pedals for a living right so uh the way i i transitioned between those two uh uh those two industries is um uh at the for those who haven't seen the movie at the at the end of the of of war dogs um i uh you know, spoiler alert, I get in a little bit of uh, legal trouble and, um, I was sentenced to seven months of house arrest, managed to avoid prison, which is very nice. I'm very grateful for that. Um, but, uh, while I was under house arrest, uh, I would have, you know, I couldn't leave the house, had the ankle tracking thing monitor on my leg. And, um, so I'd invite my friends over to hang out. It wasn't like a COVID style lockdown where nobody could visit you. People could visit you. You just can't leave your, your place. So, um, I've been a musician since I was 15. I've been playing guitar. My mom taught me to play guitar when I was 15. So I was entertaining myself and playing lots of guitar, inviting my musician friends over to jam. And, but, uh, one, one thing I really missed was playing with a drummer because uh, no drummer was going to bring his whole drum set over my apartment uh, because, you know, pain in the butt to move. And also my apartment really couldn't fit a drum set anyway. And it would have woken up, you know, made the neighbors go crazy. So <laughs> it wasn't really an option. Uh, so I bought a drum machine and uh, in order to have some beats to play to. Play to. And... Um, uh, but every time I wanted to, uh, I'm more of a singer songwriter. So anytime I'd want to like go from like verse to chorus or to a bridge or something, I'd have to stop playing my guitar, or press a button on the drum machine to hit like a fill or to change the beat and go back to playing my guitar. And it interrupted the flow of the music. It was really annoying. I tried to press the button with my toe, but I kept on pressing the wrong buttons. So I figured, I really need a drum machine that's designed for hands-free operation, like a guitar pedal. I need a drum machine 
inside a guitar pedal. Uh, and the only thing that was out there at the time was, or like looper pedals where you could turn on a beat, but it's the same beat the entire time. It's more of a backing track. And that's, I really could do that with my phone. It wasn't particularly useful. I wanted more of a dynamic controllable beat where I could do fills. I could do transitions, um, between verse and chorus, I could do pause, unpause for drum breaks, uh, accent hits, hit a cymbal crash, etc. And so I went online to try to find something like this. Couldn't find anything like it. And uh, asked my musician friends if they'd seen anything like this. And they were like, and I haven't seen anything like it, but if you find it, let me know because I want one too. That sounds super cool and useful. And so I figured if everybody wants it, nobody's making it. I'm going to make it and took me three, about three years to get a fully functional prototype. Uh, and, uh, finally brought it to market. Uh, it's called the beat buddy. If for the people who are watching this on video, you see a poster behind my head that says, you know, it's a picture of the beat buddy right there. Um, and, uh, so it's the world's first guitar pedal drum machine hybrid, and it allows you to control a beat hands-free, uh, with your foot while you play your instrument. So a single tap on the pedal will do a drum fill. If you hold it down, it does a transition. You, um, you could extend that transition as long as you want by keep keeping the pedal down. When you let go at the end of the measure, it'll change the beat to go from like verse to chorus or back. And it has many, uh, capabilities. Uh, you, it comes with 200, beats uh or like songs we call them because they're not just a single beat it's like verse chorus a bunch of fills transitions um comes with 200 songs built in 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 uh, 20 different styles 20 different genres you could also put your own beats on it so you can create your own stuff with um mac and pc software that we include for free and put those beats on it you could also create your own uh, custom drum sets it comes with 10 different drum sets so you could play any of those beats on any of the drum sets that are in there. So you could do something like uh, play a jazz beat on a heavy metal drum set or a heavy metal on hand drums or, you know, some interesting mm. uh, mashups of genres. And you could also create your own drum sets. We have um, a, um, a forum online uh, on our website, singularsound.com, where people upload the content that they create for the Beat Buddies. So they upload songs as well as and drum sets that you can download for free we also sell our own professionally made stuff so there's constantly more content more beats more drum sets coming out for it it also has midi capabilities so you can connect it to your other uh music gear uh, to your daw to your other effects uh and so it's a in so you could also create a midi controller uh, connect a midi controller to it and have many other functionality uh, added to it like uh half time double time uh, control the beat with an expression pedal to do slow buildups and slowdowns. Um, and so it's a, an extremely capable, uh, device, uh, built as a, uh, as a, um, uh, really intended for the one man band, uh, musician, or just anyone who wants to practice with dynamic drums that they, and doesn't have a drummer to play with, which is most people, at, at least at some times. So since then, so that the beat buddy came out in 2014, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, excuse me, hold on. <clears throat> um, the beat buddy came out in 2014. And since then we've come out with, uh, uh, several other music related products. Uh, we came out with, the uh, with a MIDI controller called the MIDI maestro because people wanted to, uh, control the beat buddy and be able to set up a MIDI controller easily. So the MIDI maestro has a, uh, smartphone app that you could customize how it works, uh, with a smartphone, which makes it very easy. We also, uh, came out with the Aero Sloop studio, which is the world's most advanced, uh, looper pedal it has, a uh, a uh, touch screen on it so you could actually see the loops being recorded on it. So you know where you are in the loop makes looping a lot easier has six parallel tracks as well as six song parts of each which can have par uh, six parallel tracks so it gives you a much more flexibility and capability than any other looper out there as well as making it easier to loop because you have that visual feedback of the mm. uh of the looper um we also came out with the cably which is a little cable winding device uh makes your cable management much easier um 
uh, Ben Jordan, actually, who I think was your last guest on your podcast, he reviewed some of our products. Uh, I'm a big fan of Ben. So, oh, nice. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ben's, he, Ben's awesome. Yeah, so he did a he did a great review of our products on his channel. Um, so uh, so yeah, so that's how I I got into uh, the music business, the music uh, products, musician products business. So go, going uh, right back to the start of that story, yeah. how did you only get seven months of house arrest for selling mm. three hundred million dollars? Because okay, so for starters, like the reason mm. you're on house arrest in the first place is because. Yeah. You sold a uh, hundred million rounds of uh, Chinese ammunition to the U.S. government, and there was an embargo on Chinese ammunition. Correct. That meant you weren't allowed to sell Chinese ammo to the Americans for whatever reason. I don't really right. understand those laws or why they <laughs> exist. But, but okay. Right. So I imagine, imagine that's a pretty like yeah. decently big crime to commit. How did you end up not going to prison for that and only right. end up on seven? And because your partner got four years prison, right? Right. And why yes, did he, he did. get? Why did he get prison those, and you did not? Those are excellent questions. Um, well, let me back up a little and explain exactly what it was that we did. Um, so we won a, uh, as you mentioned, a $300 million contract. Uh, I was uh, 23 years old at the time. And uh, my partner was actually 19. He's four years younger than me. And uh, we won a $300 million contract to supply uh, munitions to the U.S. Army. And the U.S. Army was giving the, those munitions to the Afghan National Army, who at the time were our allies. Uh, they were fighting the Taliban. And um, uh, one of the things it said in our contract was that no Chinese ammunition could be delivered under this contract directly or indirectly that's do you, that's do you they, know why that's a law yes that's what that's where i was going okay, next okay. um so the reason it said that is because there is an arms embargo against china it's illegal for u.s companies and uh, citizens to do military business with the chinese and the reason that's the case is because in 1989 there was the tiananmen square massacre where uh tiananmen square is the center of beijing uh, it's a big like open space in beijing and there were thousands of if not tens of thousands of college students who were protesting against the communist party and uh, they were protesting because they wanted democracy this was in 1989 and event uh, this has uh, lasted for a little bit but eventually the chinese government uh, crushed the protesters they drove tanks into the square and they shot a lot of people they killed a lot of people um and they suppressed the pro-democracy movement and this was all on international tv so it was a huge a huge um uh scandal uh at the time to put it mildly and uh in order to punish the chinese government and the army the chinese army uh for crushing this pro-democracy protest the united states placed china on an arms embargo list uh so that's why it's illegal for u.s companies and and citizens to do military business with the chinese um now however and that's why they they also put in that clause in our contract that we couldn't deliver chinese uh ammunition under, under this contract however if you had bought chinese ammunition or weapons or any military equipment in 1988 while it was still legal and you import it into the United States or into a third country. In 1990, you could still resell that ammunition uh, and or weapons uh, because you bought it legally and then you could resell it because it's not benefiting the Chinese state, the Chinese army in any way because you had already bought it right? right the money had exchanged prior exactly. to that law yeah, exactly okay. so the ammunition that we eventually got in trouble for was from albania albania is this small little country near greece um it's got a very interesting backstory about why there was so much chinese ammunition there right um, basically they were like prepping for a war that didn't happen right I yeah exactly know. exactly the 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 dictator of the country was super paranoid and and 
uh, he withdrew from the Soviet Union and allied himself with the Chinese because he thought they were the true communists and the Soviets were a bunch of hypocrites. And so he thought the Soviets would invade him. He also thought that NATO would invade him because he's a true communist believer. So he thought he, the two superpowers of the world were going to invade him at any time. And so he got massive amounts of weapons and ammunition from the Chinese. And, uh, and he did a, this in 88? Uh, no, he. this was in the 70s. Oh, okay. So this was well before the arms embargo against China. And he built a huge network of bunkers in his country to protect the weapons uh, and ammo from airstrikes. And so it, Albania became one of the heaviest armed countries on earth per capita uh, after the Iron Curtain fell and, um, and their economy collapsed. There, they, uh, for a certain period of time, they were using ammunition as currency within the country within the country so you would buy like milk or eggs with like a box of ammo that's how oh, wow. much a ammo the, the country had uh but at the time in 2007 when we won this contract uh they albania was trying to join nato and one of nato's rules was that they had to get rid of all their old ammo so they were willing to sell it for pretty much anything because otherwise they'd have to pay to get it dismantled mm. and so we were offered this ammo for a, an extremely attractive price, um, probably a, one of the reasons we won this contract. But we actually didn't know the history of the Can ammo you say at the time. How much that price was? Uh, yeah, it was. Well, so I will say that this that this particular ammo was only about about ten percent of the value of the contract. Right. So it wasn't the most expensive part of the contract because we also were delivering grenades and anti aircraft rockets, which were much more expensive. Um, but uh, so we were buying that ammo for about mm -hmm. about four cents around, and we were selling it to the government for ten and a half cents around. Uh, but shipping cost us about five cents. So it wasn't like we were <laughs> making a huge, huge margin, but still there, this was tens of millions of dollars in this ammo. Um, still only about 10, and 15, the yeah. rockets and the grenades, were they also Chinese? No. So this oh. was the only Chinese stuff. So everything else was completely, uh, legal and, and above, above board and everything. Um, it was just this particular ammo that was coming from Albania that had originally come from China. Uh, and when we had originally made the agreement to buy this stuff, we didn't actually know the history of this ammo. We didn't know it was originally Chinese. So we agreed to buy it and we got all the, all the, um, all the licenses to, tr to, to import it and to export it and to transport it, uh, because you need to get a lot of licenses for military equipment. You yeah, need to get and then your certificate, an export license, and you also need to get uh, flyover permits, what they call them, uh, so that every country that you fly over with your military equipment, you need to get specific permission and a license from that country to fly your stuff over their airspace. That's wild. That's like probably yeah. hundreds of licenses, yeah. right? Especially if it you're flying was, over somewhere like Europe or something. Yeah. So it was going from Albania to Afghanistan. I think it was about 15 licenses we needed. There were about 15 countries we flo flew over approximately. Um, and some of those countries were not very friendly to the United States, so it took us uh, quite a while. Uh, and who do to... you even talk to about getting that license? So uh, what usually what usually you do is the the transportation company will make the first attempt to get the license. So you hire a transportation company, the ones who own or at least are leasing the aircraft, and they will try to get the licenses from from the countries. But if those countries are resistant, then they'll come back to you and say, hey, hey, you know, is there anything you could do on your end to help us move these licenses along? And what we would do is we would contact the, um, what they call the defense attache in the U.S. embassy in that particular country. So every Every U.S. embassy has a, uh, a an officer from the military called the defense attaché who is responsible to uh, for um, communication between the Pentagon and the State Department. And so, <clears throat> our contract was with the U.S. Army, which is part of the Pentagon. Uh, the the embassies are run by the State Department, and they're the ones who have uh, contact with the with the countries that the embassy is based in. So we would contact the embassy, asked to speak to the defense attache. We'd 
verify that we had a real contract uh, so that they knew that we were real. And uh, then they would use their contacts with the, within the embassy uh, and within the country to try to get that uh, license approved. Um, now, usually that would work, but sometimes it wouldn't. <laughs> and like for one example is we, uh, we were trying to get um, a license from, uh, I think it was from Uzbekistan. And uh, Uzbekistan is, uh, uh, or maybe it was Turkmenistan. I, <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, no, it was Turkmenistan. I was, I'm confused. I got it confused. It was uh, Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan is a, uh, one of the Central Asian countries near Afghanistan that was part of the Soviet Union. And um, they're still very close to Russia. And Russia was, uh, for various reasons, was not happy, as, happy uh, with us at the time. Uh, they thought they were going to get the contract to supply this, but then they supplied nuclear technology to Iran and they got put on a blacklist. So the US Army canceled negotiations with them over this contract because they were now placed on a blacklist. So that's why they ended up uh, we ended up getting this contract and we weren't allowed to buy anything from the Russians because they were on a blacklist. And so the Russians were very unhappy about losing this big contract. And so they did everything they could to prevent us from delivering on it. Cause I guess they figured if we failed, the U S army would be forced to go back to them. Um, so they leaned, they were leaning on the central Asian countries to not give us flyover permits and, and, uh, Turkmenistan wouldn't give us a flyover permit. And then I realized, well, you know, what if we, we hired the Turkmenistani national airline to do the transportation and then they'll have a financial incentive to give us well, a permit just fly around it. Like just don't fly over it. It, you could, but it would significantly increase the costs of the of the of the transport. And you know, as I said, we were paying four cents around, uh, but paying five cents in transportation. Mm. And that's because Afghanistan is a landlocked country surrounded by a bunch of unfriendly countries uh, and unstable countries. So you're making pack, you know, half a cent around basically uh one and a half cents we we're sell selling it for uh for ten and a half cents so we we're 100 making, million rounds that's quite a lot of money it, it was more like 200 million rounds but yeah. uh oh, yeah it was sure. about it was about 200 million rounds there's 150 million rounds of the ak-47 ammo and uh, another 50 million about of uh heavy machine gun ammo and so yeah i mean we were gonna make millions of dollars from this um but still it was a small percentage three of, million dollars yeah, yeah yeah there you go you did the math good job uh, <laughs> um and so uh so yeah so we realized we you know we offered the the transportation contract to the turkmenistani national airline and they actually accepted it and suddenly our flyover permit was approved uh within days so uh it would they just needed a financial incentive i guess as as yep. most people do but uh once we we got all the flyover permits in place we decided hey you know we're going to uh we're going to do an inspection on the ammo just to make sure that everything's good you know just to be on the safe side and we also wanted to save money on the transportation and uh, transportation because it was so expensive their transportation was uh the biggest part of it was the weight so if we could reduce the weight then we would save a lot of money on the transportation. Uh, at the time, actually, we were going to lose money on it because there was a huge spike in oil prices, which is the majority of the cost of transportation by air by air freight. Uh, so if we didn't save money on the transportation, we were going to lose money on this segment of the contract. So we went over to Albania and uh, mm -hmm. we looked at the ammo. And we're, the plan was to remove the because they were packed in these metal tins which were airtight and uh, the metal tins were in these heavy wooden crates and so we were going to just ship it without the wooden crates to save weight and um we realized when we got there to inspect it that there was chinese markings all over everything like all over the wooden crates all over the metal tins and there was chinese paperwork inside the metal tins and and we we were like oh crap our our contract says that we can't deliver Chinese ammo. Um, so what should we do about this? And so we thought, well, you know, this ammo does not violate the embargo because it was given to the, it wasn't even bought by the Albanians. It was given to them as a, as a gift by the China, their Chinese allies. 
in the 70s, so it doesn't violate the embargo. Um, Even however, if it were after 1988, it probably still wouldn't, right? Because it's a gift. That's debatable. I don't know, honestly. Okay. Because uh, there's no money involved, right? Yeah, that is true. That is true. So I don't know what the legal uh, ramifications would have mm -hmm. been if there was no money involved after it was, it was uh, you know, the embargo was put in place. But we did know for sure that this was before the embargo because it had the dates of manufacture okay, on so the boxes. So irrelevant anyway. So exactly. So it's irrelevant anyway. So we realized this didn't violate the embargo, but it did violate the terms of our contract because our contract didn't mention the embargo. Our just commercial, said no Chinese ammo. It just said no Chinese ammo period, uh, right. either directly or indirectly. So um, we thought, well, you know, it violates the terms of our commercial contract, doesn't violate the embargo. So what we could do is we could go to the U.S. Army and say, hey, guys, you know, we're ready to deliver. We got all the licenses. We know you need this ammo, you know, desperately, which is what they kept on telling us because uh, it was getting into fighting season in Afghanistan. They only fight uh, they can't fight during the winter because Afghanistan has very tall mountains and a lot of snow. So it was becoming springtime and fighting season was starting and, and our Afghan allies were getting attacked by the Taliban and our Afghan allies were running out of ammo and the, the U.S. Army was desperate for more ammo and they kept on calling us up and saying, when are you going to deliver? When are you going to deliver? And we were like, oh, well, we've been having some trouble with the licenses. And so it took us like a couple months to get all that squared away. When we finally got it squared away, we're, we realized it was Chinese ammo, and uh, we we um, uh, we could have gone to the army and said, "Hey, I know you need this ammo real bad. We got everything ready to go, but we just discovered that it was originally from China, but it doesn't violate the embargo. Can you give us a waiver for the contract? Can you give us a, a letter that says that you know you're going to modify the contract and allow us to deliver this ammo right. because at the risk of potentially losing it and exactly. not making three million dollars? And... Yeah, exactly. So we if we thought well, they could have given us a waiver, but they also could say something along the lines of, you know, all your competitors bid on this contract with the with the requirement that no Chinese ammo could be delivered under it. So it's not fair to them that we allow you to deliver even though it doesn't violate the embargo, it's not fair to your competitors to allow you to deliver this Chinese ammo because they had to compete with that requirement in there. So we thought, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't risk losing our $300 million contract uh, because they it's all part of one thing. It wouldn't be that they would just take away that component. They would have to uh, rebid, put out for bid uh, the entire $300 million contract. And so we figured, well, you know what, maybe we shouldn't tell them about it because we don't want to take the chance of losing our $300 million contract. So what we decided to do was we hired an Albanian uh, box, cardboard box manufacturer to manufacture these really thick, strong cardboard boxes and had his workers repackage the ammunition into... Um, into these cardboard boxes to remove any sign that it was um, <clears throat> that it was Chinese ammunition. Uh, that you know went fine uh, until uh, until at my former partner Ephraim, uh, the guy played by Jonah Hill in the movie, um, he wanted to make more money as he always did, and he tried to renegotiate the better price with the Albanian uh, with the Albanian government. And they said, well, you know, we're not going to give you a better price, but why don't we know you're repackaging the ammo? Why don't you give us the contract to repackage the ammo? We will make some money on that repackaging operation, and then we can give you a discount on the ammo, uh, you know, because we'll be making more money. And Ephraim said, sure, you know, that the yeah, original cardboard box guy, you know, repackaging guy is fired. You guys are hired, you know, done, done deal. The original guy, got stuck with about $20,000 worth of boxes that he had nothing to do with now. And he asked Ephraim to buy it, buy it from him. And uh, he asked me to ask Ephraim. And I told Ephraim, hey, you know, we need these boxes anyway. Let's, let's buy these boxes. And Ephraim's like, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll do it. Don't worry about it. And um, I think there was some bad blood between the, the original box guy and the new <laughs> the new people so they didn't want to deal with each other and Ephraim just didn't want to pay the guy the 20 grand to cover his 
his uh, losses. So, which is ultimately how you guys got caught, right? And that's how we got caught. Correct. So the box guy got very upset that he got stuck with twenty thousand dollars worth of boxes, uh, and he decided to go and tell the New York Times about what we were doing, and he also told the FBI about what we were doing. And so both of those organizations started an investigation into what we were doing. And um, it came out later in, in court that the, that the Justice Department had, asked, had informed the U.S. Army that what we were delivering was Chinese ammunition. And the Army informed them back. This is all in emails that came out in court later. The Army informed them that they really needed the ammo. And the only way they were going to stop taking delivery on it was if they got a letter from the Attorney General of the United States instructing them to stop taking delivery, the, the leader of the Justice Department. And, and that letter never materialized. So the letter never came from the Attorney General. So the U.S. Army kept on taking delivery of the, of the ammunition uh, for like another six months after they had found out that it was Chinese. Um, and then the New York Times published a front page article about us. And it was not a flattering article. Uh, my mugshot, my partner's mugshot were on the front page of the New York Times. We didn't look great. Uh, it was next to a picture of rusty looking ammunition. And the, the New York Times said that all the ammunition we were delivering was low quality, rusty ammunition that was defective and that we were putting our uh, 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 Afghan allies in jeopardy, which wasn't true. Um, we did deliver about 30,000 rounds that were, that was low quality uh, and that was rejected by the U S hundred million, like but at, out of a, out of 200 million. Yeah. <laughs> it was a tiny, tiny fraction in the bucket and you have higher rates of, of uh, defects in from brand new ammunition out of the factory. So it was, it, this is a normal thing. I mean, the U S uh, the government will always inspect the goods they receive. And if the quality is not up to par, they reject it and they don't pay you for it. And we didn't get paid for that, those 30,000 rounds. And however, Afghanistan didn't have any ammunition uh, disposal facilities. So what they did is they just put the stuff like to the side uh, uh, by the airport where it was delivered. They just uh, shoved it to the side uh, where it was out of everyone's way and they just left it there. And so when the New York Times went to Afghanistan to investigate our, the story, they asked to see some of the ammo that we had delivered and they were pointed mm. at the only ammo that was left lying around in the area was the rusty ammo. And so they got a bunch of pictures of that and either they assumed or they I don't know whether they purposefully, you know, decided to uh, to make it seem like everything we were doing, but they definitely wrote the article in a way that made it sound like everything we were delivering was this. Well, low he, also, humans' defect ability stuff. to subitize. So, subitize is the ability mm. to look at a group of objects and to know how many it is. So, for instance, right. I can like look on my desk, and if there's like three items, I can look at it and without counting the items, know that right. it's about three. Whereas right. if it's about like 10 or more, if right. I look at it quickly without counting it, I have no, like you, you top out at around five uh, mm -hmm. items for subitization. And actually that number is about the same as crows. Ah, um, I believe it. So I feel like when you yeah. look at 30,000 rounds of ammunition, they're probably just yeah. like, oh, that's 200,000 rounds, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if they, they really oh, sorry, counted. 200, 200 yeah. million. No, of course right. they didn't count it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, don't, I, I don't think they counted it or, or really cared you know i think they were just trying to get a good story and um and you know it was a big story it became a huge international scandal uh because we were so young we were in our early 20s and and um uh, of course the new york times uh made this uh like we became like the post the poster children so to speak of uh the botched procurement process uh you know how could this was the bush administration at the time how could the bush administration trust these two 20 something year olds to do this huge contract and this is just a level of incompetence uh, displayed by the government etc cetera, etc cetera. even though i mean we were delivering to the army's satisfaction they were actually very happy with our performance under the contract up until that point but it became a huge international scandal um 
there's there's clips on YouTube of uh, of uh, of congressmen uh, with posters of our mugshots in Congress uh, from the New York Times that they were like, how could these guys win such a big contract and etc. And so a few days later, um, the U.S. Army announced that they were going to cancel our contract. That they had no idea that the stuff we were delivering was originally Chinese, even though they did. Um, and uh, the Justice Department uh, decided to charge us. Um, they had six months prior. They had raided. Uh, they had raided our office. I was actually not working uh, with the company anymore because about two months before that, before the raid, right when everything started going smoothly on the contract, Ephraim decided he didn't want to pay me uh, what we had agreed to. He wanted to give me a tiny fraction of what yeah, we had he, agreed he's... to. He's portrayed as a real cunt in the movie. Yeah, he's actually a lot worse in real life than mm -hmm. in the movie. They in the movie they actually this is one of the rare cases where they uh, where they they um, they made him less of an extreme character in the movie than he really was in in Maybe real Jonah life. Hill just can't be that much of a cunt. He, he, well, it, they the screenwriter <laughs> it's possible the screenwriter told me that they did it on purpose when they were writing the screenplay because they wanted to make him a bit more lovable a little bit more relatable and so if they had written him the way he really was um it would have you know kind of it, it would make people relate to the characters less mm. so they hollywood does this kind of thing they rewrite yeah, stories yeah, in order to make a good movie and you know they they have to put in a certain amount of action so they put in you know the whole driving through the triangle of death scene uh which did not happen to us oh, okay. though it yeah, did I was, happen i was gonna ask about that yeah, as well it, it, it is a true story but it's not did you it, did you really did get in the elevator with him and go down and open and the FBI was there no, and in the elevator ride, you punched him in the face. And no, I, I wish, happened. but no. none of that happened. No, <laughs> I was very tempted to punch him in the face. Uh, at the time he informed me he didn't want to pay me, but I realized that he would just use that as a weapon against me in court. Uh, right. you know, he would be able to sue me for assault and I didn't want to give him that, that leverage. So I, uh, didn't I restrained myself and did not punch him in the face. Um, and yeah, I mean, by the time the FBI got involved, um, it wasn't actually the FBI, it was, uh, customs and DCIS. DCIS is the defense crimes investigative service, which is the Pentagon's internal like FBI. Um, uh, but they're federal agents. And, uh, so by the time they got involved, I wasn't even working in the company anymore. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, they they raided the his office around two months after I had left the company, and they f they found plenty of evidence in his office, including a, a handwritten note on his desk uh, with a to do list in his in his handwriting, and one of the items was repackaged Chinese ammo. So, <laughs> you know, they they had all the evidence they needed, uh, and there was plenty of incriminating evidence on email. Um, you know, we weren't as careful as we should have been in covering this whole thing up. Uh, so I knew that there was no, there was no denying this. And so I pled guilty. Um, uh, oh, and like, I should say that after they raided the office, we weren't sure because a lot of government, uh, you know, the justice department opens lots of investigations, but they don't always, those investigations don't always lead to criminal charges. Uh, and they were debating whether or not to charge us criminally at the time, because as the U S army was saying, they really needed the ammo. And if they charged us with criminal charges, that would put a stop to the ammo deliveries. Um, so they, so they had that incentive, but, uh, so they did not do anything for about six months. And it, we thought that they were just not going to charge us because the army leaned on them, uh, and told them that they needed the ammo. But then after the New York times article came out, there was just too much political pressure made everybody look bad. Yeah, and they had then, to like make an example of it. Exactly. They had to they pretty much throw us under the bus to cover their asses. And uh, so that's what they did. They, as soon as the New York Times article came out, like a few days later, they announced that they, they were going to charge us with fraud. And uh, the way they portrayed it was because the thing is that fraud. <laughs> Actually, uh, usually what fraud implies is that you are defrauding someone out of money. Mm. 
right? You know, like some, you, you, you trick somebody, you lie to somebody, they lose money, you gain money. That's generally the, the general basic, uh, uh, definition of fraud. In this case, the government didn't lose any money. In fact, they saved a huge amount of money by going with us by, because we are by far the lowest price, uh, amongst our, that's why we won the contract because we we're much lower. Uh, we were actually, as they say in the movie, we're about 52 or $53 million lower than the nearest competition. That's actually true. Um, we didn't Did find you that, actually rock yeah. up to that meeting where they told you that high. Uh, so that meeting happened, but I wasn't actually in it. Okay. Was that <laughs> from high? F, you know, I'm not really sure. It wouldn't surprise me because he was doing a lot of drugs at the time. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he was on cocaine either because um, he was just doing that on, on a regular basis at that time. But um, at the time, uh, he felt because he was super young. I mean, he was uh, at, the time, at that time we had, uh, yeah, he was 21 at that time. So um, uh, he felt like we needed someone to, to, uh, uh, make the government feel a little bit more secure. So we, he took, uh, Ralph, who is the, in the movie, he's the laundry laundromat owner. Who's our investor. Yeah. Uh, that's, he ended that's, up, uh, putting yeah. a wire. Did he actually end up putting a wire? No, that, and... that part is not true. He okay. didn't, he didn't do that at all. Uh, uh, so, uh, Ralph in real life is not a Jewish laundry sto store owner, a laundromat owner. He is actually a Mormon machine gun factory owner. Oh. So a little bit more relevant and he's based in Utah. So he's an wow. older gen, he's an older gentleman and, um, he was our investor for a very long time. Um, but, um, interesting that they've decided to make him a Jewish laundry store owner instead of just a more yeah. machine gun factory owner. Yeah. I think they wanted to, because there was already kind of that Jewish theme because both Ephraim and I are Jewish and we grew up, uh, actually amongst the Orthodox Jewish community. So, uh, you know, very religiously Jewish families. Um, so they, I guess they wanted to keep like a Jewish theme and, uh, they always simplify the stories in general in Hollywood. Mm. Um, so, uh, they remove characters and combine characters and, and things of that nature. And, and, um, so yeah, so Ephraim took Ralph to that meeting, uh, just because he was older and he felt like it would make the government feel more secure that it wasn't just like a couple of kids who were running this contract, that there was some experience yeah, yeah, makes sense. In, in the management. But, um, uh, so anyway, um, I'm kind of getting, getting a bit, uh, down a few, a few sidetracks, but, um, I guess we'll, we'll go back to why, to the whole sentencing thing, how that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Why so when, you, this yeah, is all to yeah. answer why you, only yes, got seven exactly. House arrest. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. It's a, it's a comp complicated story. No, so, fine. um, so what happened when they charged us was the way they charged us was they said, you guys, uh, you know, every aircraft load of, of this Chinese, originally Chinese ammunition, uh, every aircraft load that you delivered, you included a document, right? A uh, what they call a certificate of conformance, uh, where where you you um, have listed what kind of ammunition is on is on the plane, the quantity of ammunition, uh, and the year of manufacture and the place of origin, right? That was that was the term on it, place of origin, and you guys put out place of origin. Albania, but you knew that the original place of origin was China. And not only did you know, you hired someone to cover it up. So this, uh, is an act of fraud. You're lying to the government, right? You knowingly lying to the government and you had 71 aircraft loads of this ammunition delivered. So that's 71 counts of fraud and each count can get you up to five years in prison. So that's up to 355 years that you can get in prison. If you fight us and you plead innocent, you go to court and you lose and you get the maximum from the judge, right? Uh, however, if you plead guilty, uh, as prosecutors, they have the leeway to combine 71 counts into one. They can count it as instead of 71, it's one. And so you get maximum five years. And, uh, and because you plead guilty in the plea agreement, we'll say, we'll commit to, to telling the judge that, that you are, you know, really sorry about everything you did and that you, you know, you owned up to your mistakes and that you, therefore you should get the minimum 
uh, sentence rather than the maximum sentence. And maximum will only be five years at that point. But because the judge generally listens to the prosecutor, maybe you'll get one year, maybe just probation. Who knows? You know, up to the judge. So that was the choice I was faced with. Uh, we were both faced with, um, you know, either fight him in court and maybe spend the rest of your life in prison. And even if you win, you know, it's still going to cost you a few hundred thousand dollars to hire a good lawyer to even have a fighting chance. And um, I didn't have a few hundred thousand dollars because uh, Ephraim didn't pay me for the contract. And I was living off of my life savings at the time because I wasn't earning a salary. I was only working on a commission basis. So I, so I didn't have the money to fight them anyway. And so I really just had the option to plead guilty. Um, Ephraim at first fought them for like a couple years he was fighting them, but then eventually realized he was going to lose. And so he ended up pleading guilty as well. And so we both signed our plea agreements. However, Ralph did not plead guilty. He decided to take it to court. And because he decided to take it to court, uh, we were required as part of our plea agreements to testify in uh, trial uh, if called to do so. And so they weren't going to um, sentence us until his trial was over, right? So that they could hold that sentencing over our heads to make sure that we testify and that we cooperate. So that trial process ended up taking about three years uh, because there was a, a mistrial. The first trial, there was one dissenting juror. And, and so they had to do the whole trial again. And eventually, unfortunately for Ralph, uh, he, got, he got convicted. And he also got sentenced to, instead of, he didn't get 355 years, uh, he, the judge had sentenced him to four years, which is still no picnic. Uh, he was in his seventies, so no picnic. Um, but, uh, Ephraim, uh, part of the plea agreement, they give you a bunch of, uh, they give you a bunch of, um, uh, requirements, right? They say one thing they told us to do was we couldn't leave Miami-Dade County. We couldn't leave uh, South Florida. Uh, they wanted us to stay here. Uh, another thing is they didn't want us to be in the arms business, right? They said we couldn't do any more of the arms business. So I, of course, was scared shitless and I went back to school and I got a job at a nonprofit and I was just making myself look as good as possible as a goody two shoes as I could be t for the judge to give me a light sentence. And, um, Ephraim, of course, is, uh, has a much higher tolerance for risk than I do. And he kept, you know, kept on doing the arms business secretly through an, in, through a friend of his, you know, he had all the paperwork done under his friend's name and his friend, I should say in quotation marks, because he ended up, uh, you know, screwing that guy over too, as he did everybody. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but the thing is Ephraim is also a control freak. So whenever it got into the heat of negotiations, he would, ins you know, cause he'd listen in on conversations that his friend was uh, having with potential business partners. He, he'd, uh, and he was a very good negotiator to give him credit. He was a very good negotiator. And so he would insist on getting on the phone himself. Uh, and he'd say, Oh, I'm a con outside consultant. I'm just gonna, you know, uh, here just to talk. And he would do negotiations. And of course that whole vibe, uh, aroused the suspicions of one of his potential business partners that he was trying to do a deal with. That guy, uh, uh who was based in Orlando, uh, in central Florida, uh, called up the ATF. He realized who Ephraim was, had Googled him and realized, Hey, this guy's, un you know, has been convicted of, uh, fraud with the U S government. Um, you know, why is he trying to do this business deal with me? Maybe he's trying to entrap me into doing something illegal so that he could get a reduction on his sentence. Mm. So that guy uh, called up the ATF, the Alcohol Tobacco Firearms Administration uh, agency, and uh, and told them about hey, I got this convicted arms dealer, uh, you know, trying to do this business deal with me, what should I do? And so they said, Oh, that's very interesting. Why don't you introduce one of our undercover agents as your business partner? And so that's what he did. He introduced an undercover ATF agent to Ephraim. Ephraim was speaking to the undercover agent on the phone. The agent says, Hey, we can do this deal, but you know, I, I only do deals with people I meet face to face. You know, why don't you come up to Orlando to meet? Right. So Ephraim goes up to Orlando. He violates the terms of his bond, which he was not allowed to leave South Florida, goes up to Orlando and meets the, the undercover agent. And the agent, uh, 
uh, pulls out, you know, he's like, Hey, you know, like, I, you know, I, I know about the whole, uh, the whole thing, you know, you've been in the papers about, and you know, it's super cool. Don't worry about it. You know, I, I think it's a really, you know, just shows you, you know, like shows that you're a real, uh, mover and shaker, you know, but Hey, check out this, this later latest handgun that I, I just bought, you know, it's the, the HK, you know, like it's, it's the super cool handgun. Look at these sites. And Ephraim was, is a total gun nut. So he picks up the gun from the agent and he's like, yeah, this thing's so cool i heard about this thing let's go to the let's go to the uh to the uh range and fire off a few rounds and and he's like because what can i say you know once a gun runner always always a gun runner am i right and uh this is what he tells the undercover agent and then the undercover agent whips out a pair of handcuffs slaps him on ephraim and says you're uh, a felon in possession of a firearm you're under arrest because as a because he already pled guilty uh he was officially a felon and it's illegal for felons to be in possession oh, of a so firearm he had it, yeah he had him right there and then on like a he had a him right there charge completely exactly he entrapped him right. into into this uh, into this gun is charge that legal is that entrapment stuff legal it is. It's uh, people think that oh, if you, I ask you if you're a cop, you have to tell me. That's yeah, not yeah. true at all. That's right. just Hollywood. Uh, cops yep. do not. Undercover cops do not have to tell you they're a cop, and there is lots of leeway for law enforcement to entrap you. Uh, there, there are some laws against it, but it's it's a lot more loose than people think. You know, you can't just get off because the government tricked you. It happens all the time. In fact. Uh, one thing people don't know is that law enforcement is legally allowed to lie to you, right? So they can tell, uh, like when they, this is a very common technique when they're doing interrogations, uh, that, you know, if, if there's more than one person involved, they'll tell you, you know, your buddy already admitted to the crime and said you were involved. He told us everything. He told us that you, in fact, he said that you were the ringleader and that it's most of the response. He's trying to pin everything on you. So if you don't come clean here, you know, you're going to get most of the blame and you're going to go down the hardest. So you, you, sh you should just, you know, tell us what you know and, and, you know, then we'll, we'll go to bat for you and, and make sure that you get off as easy as possible. And they could, that could be a complete lie. Uh, but that's how they trick a lot of people into, into confessing. So yeah, the, the the law enforcement has tremendous leeway to entrap people and to lie to people and to trick people. It's it's uh, it's not like it is in the movies. Um, so anyway, Ephraim got gets arrested for this for this uh, gun charge. Uh, he could have gotten up to ten years in prison for that, but um, in addition to that, uh, because he committed a second he committed a second crime before he was sentenced, he invalidated his plea agreement. So that's one of the things in, as part of the plea agreement is you are not allowed to commit another crime before your sentence, because how, how are the prosecutors going to tell the judge that you're a reformed yeah, you know, yeah. uh, person and good boy from now on, if you're, if you're committing more crimes. So, so the prosecutors did not go to bat for him or request the judge go easy on him. Uh, he could have gotten, uh, up to 15 years total, 10 for the gun, for the gun charge and, and, uh, five for the fraud charge. Uh, but it's he, wild that, the yeah. just picking up a gun on yeah. probation would yeah. get him more years. Yeah, than supply than than the original thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of crazy. It is pretty crazy. Yeah. The, the laws are not necessarily, uh, all like one one of those other. things seems like kind of minor to me and the other thing yeah. seems like extremely major to me yeah it's, no it's obvious I, which is which yeah uh that that is true um that's that's how this that's how the system is run i mean there's a lot of things that you would think uh uh yeah, would be a, a lot worse than others i mean there's there's people who you know get caught up in the three strikes laws where they you know get caught shoplifting and they spend like decades in prison because it's their third strike even though all they did was steal a candy bar because they were starving mm. and and you know and then someone else um, beats his wife to an inch of death and gets off in a year you know i mean it's 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 insane. Some of the laws are very, very not fair. Maybe um, AI could potentially help with a bit of this. I think there's like AI. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's like services that people have made now for AI yeah. that will like cancel subscriptions for you and like uh, call up credit yeah. card companies to get like charges disputed and stuff. And like all of these companies have 
uh, like barricades in the way to stop you mm-hmm. from doing that. They're like, oh, do you want to like yeah. talk to this other person? Do you want to do this? Right. Would you like to like sign up for True. this second deal instead yeah. of canceling your other deal? But AI is mm-hmm. just ruthless. It doesn't care yeah. about anything other than completing the task. So it'll go through all of these phone call trees and it will go through yeah. like any web page for as many hours as it takes to get the task just finished that you tell it to do. Yeah, and I think in a way, yeah, perhaps AI could be an interesting judge at the end of the day because it removes all emotion from it and just goes like, here's that a scale of shit that is bad. You get this much for doing X bad thing. There Which is, in your case may have worked against your favor. Yeah, but. I mean, there is a, there's a lot, there's a very strong argument to be made for AI judges um, because one thing that is a well-known thing in the, in the, uh, in the, um, the justice community, I guess, the justice field, I would say, is that uh, judges, and this is statistically proven, judges give harsher sentences before lunch and eat more lenient sentences after lunch. Yeah, because the more hungry they are, the less, uh, the less empathetic they are. So you, are, you will get off a lot easier uh, if, you, if you catch the judge on a good day at a good time. Uh, and that just really drives the point home of how, of how much our human emotion affects our supposedly rational decision-making. Um, now I'm not saying this is a 100% thing. I'm not saying that judges will let you off scot-free after lunch and give you life in prison before lunch, but there is a statistical significant difference of people who get sentenced before and after the judge has eaten. So did you uh, get sentenced before or after lunch? <laughs> you know, I'm not, I don't, I honestly don't remember the time of the day. Uh, it, unfortunately, the, they don't give the defendant the option of choosing his sentencing time. They just, the judge makes that decision. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't remember at the time what the time of the day it was, but uh, I was very lucky because uh, the judge just went with the prosecutor's recommendation of of only house of seven months of house arrest. That was what the prosecutors recommended to the judge, and the judge says, oh, "If the prosecutors recommend that, I can agree with that," and that that was the end of that. Um, the uh, on in Ephraim's case, uh, the the prosecutors were trying to get him a lot more, and of course his his he hired very expensive attorneys. Um, and they were trying to get him a lot less. The judge kind of came down in the middle and gave him four years at, for both charges. Uh, so, yeah. So, and he got out, I think, after three and a half years. He got like maybe a half a year off for good behavior or something. He, he went to a minimum security prison, federal prisons, which is nothing like a state prison uh, where all the nightmare stories you hear about are. I'm not saying it's a picnic. I would don't wish that on anyone. Um, uh, you know, I would certainly be, be, uh, uh, be very distraught if I had to spend any amount of time in any prison, but, Dude, um, jail, so yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't been to prison, but I've been to jail yeah. and I unfortunately went in on, mm-hmm. uh, Thursday at like 3am uh, Yeah, and I probably would have only spent like an hour there cause it was like a crazy, like a, just a misdemeanor yeah. thing. Right, um, but because I went in on Thursday at right. three a.m. They don't process cases on Friday, Saturday, or uh, Sunday, and then Monday was Jesus Labor Day, Christ. so I ended up spending four days in jail, wow, like in the harsh. in the jumpsuit and everything, yeah. and like hanging out with a bunch of people who yeah. had done all sorts of crimes, and yeah. yeah, it was it was not fun. It was definitely like four of the worst days of my life for sure. I I, didn't I was spend, like yeah, so fucking yeah. scared in there, man. Like it was yeah. brutal. No, it is. I I had a similar experience, uh, actually where, uh, I also got arrested on, this is for something completely separate <laughs> before this whole story. Uh, this is in my early twenties. Um, I, uh, yeah, I got arrested on a Friday and, uh, I didn't get out until like Sunday afternoon. So not as long as yours, but I totally get what you're saying. It's an extremely, extremely unpleasant experience. And to, to think about spending years there is just, extremely depressing and uh, you want to hear something funny um earlier this year uh so every i'm an immigrant from australia who lives in Mm -hmm. america so every three Mm -hmm. years i need to renew my visa and to to renew my visa i have to leave the country and go Mm -hmm. to an embassy in a different country which i think Mm -hmm. they make you do so if you don't get your visa you're already out Uh, they don't have to find you and throw you out right makes sense Um, so anyway this time around i had that jail charge uh it wasn't Mm -hmm. a charge i didn't get charged uh-huh. I had this like jail arrest. I had an arrest mm-hmm. on my record. Right, you had an arrest, yeah. And um, 
I went up to the interview and the USCIS officer who was interviewing me goes like, oh, I see there's a new arrest thing on, on mm-hmm. your record. And he's like, what do you do for a living? And I go, music. And he's like, oh, are you a rapper? And I was like, ah. no, dude. <laughs> Jesus that? Christ. Yeah, I was like, that's, fuck, that's fucked up to say. Dude. Yeah, for real. That's pretty classic. Uh, pretty classic. Yeah, no, there's 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 definitely a... Um, Plenty, plenty of uh, of uh, that thought, thought process in the system. Um, mm. Yeah. So you sound, but, you sound yeah. like a pretty entrepreneurial guy. Like mm. uh, at first in the movie, you were a massage therapist. Yes. And then you were like, I, I don't like doing this. I'm just going to buy a bunch of bed sheets and sell it to um, mm. like old people homes or hospices. Right. right. And then you got into this gun thing. Yeah. And now you're like, oh, I spent seven months at home and I realized yeah. there was a gap in the market for guitar pedals, so now I make yeah. those. Yeah. Is that always been the case even before you were a massage therapist and before the bedsheet thing? Like, how, Are you just yeah. kind of naturally entrepreneurial like that? Uh, well, I guess so because my well, my first my first business, uh, it's, a, it's actually a really cute story. Uh, my first business was when I was six years old. Um, and uh, the... Uh, the way that got started um, was I was living in Israel at the time, um, and Were I lived in a. There? I was born in St. Louis, Missouri, in okay. the United States, but my family moved to Israel when I was a baby. And um, my my parents are both American as well, but they're Jewish. So, so you, my dad. You grew up in Israel then. Until I was eight years old, I okay. moved to Miami when I was eight years old. So, so I did grow up speaking Hebrew, but because my parents are American, we always spoke English at home. And when I came to the United States, I lost a lot of my Hebrew. I still have a basic, uh, Hebrew skills, but, but just basic. Um, so, uh, yeah, so at the time I was living in Israel and we were living in this, like one of these old apartment buildings that didn't have an elevator and it didn't have a garbage chute. And so what you'd have to do is you have to take your trash out down the stairs and, and, uh, to the big dumpster on the corner and toss it in there. And, uh, so my mom asked me and my older sister, uh, who's a year and a half older than me. So I guess she was like seven, seven, eight at the time. Um, she asked us to take out the trash and like, we were busy playing Legos and we were like, Oh, we don't really want to do that. We're busy playing, you know? And my mom started getting annoyed at us. She's like, I've asked you to take out the trash. And so my dad walks by and he's like, Hey, you know what, what's going on? And, and, uh, you know, our mother tells him, Oh, they don't want to, they're, they're, you know, not, they don't want to take out the trash. And so our dad, um, who's like the ultimate cheerleader, (laughs) he, he goes to us, he's like, He's the ultimate glass half full kind of guy. He goes to us, um, you know, you guys are like looking at this all wrong. You, uh, you think that, uh, that, that, that taking out the trash is a, uh, is a big, is a big burden and it's, you know, a big pain, but really it's a big opportunity for you. And we're like, what are you talking about? How's taking out the trash a big opportunity? He's like, well, think about it. We live in an apartment building. All the other neighbors, I bet you they don't want to take out the trash either. You can start a business where you offer to take out their trash. Uh, and you know, people don't have take out the trash every day, so you could do it every other day, so maybe three times a week. And you could charge them a little bit of money every week, let's say you know, a shekel a week, which just comes out to about a quarter. And uh, we're like, oh, wow, that's a great idea. And he's like, yeah, it is. Now, why don't you go practice and take your mother's trash out? <laughs> And so we're like, okay, fine. So we go to all our neighbors and we offer our service and we signed up, I think it was either seven or eight neighbors and to our, to our service. And we had, and so we took, we alternated. So we'd take like three or four neighbors out, uh, trash out every day. And, uh, after about a week we had, we had this, uh, like a big, like kind of like metal wire cart on wheels that we would put the trash bag in and like roll it down the steps, you know, ka-chunk, 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 you know, down the steps and take it out, wheel it out to the, to the dumpster. And then it would take both of us cause we were small, like to swing the trash over into the dumpster. And, um, uh, after about a week, we told our dad, this is way too much work. Uh, you know, it's, it's not worth, it's not worth the money. And he tells us, he's like, well, what if you were making twice as much money? Would it be worth it then? 
And we're like, well, twice as much money. Yeah, okay, maybe for twice as much money, it would be worth it. And so he's like, well, why don't you just tell the neighbors that you, uh, that you are raising your prices and it's going to be 50 cents a week now. And we told the world, but like we just said that it was a quarter a week or a week ago. How could we just change the price like that? And he said, well, if you're not going to raise the price, you're going to quit. So they could either pay the extra or you're not going to do it anyway. So there's, you might as well ask and see if they're willing to pay it. And so we went to all the neighbors and we told them the new price and all of them said, no problem, 50 cents a week. It's, it's, that's okay. Uh, we had one neighbor quit. And from then on, we saw their daughter take out the trash, which we've <laughs> never seen before. I guess they figured, you know, why pay the neighbor's kids when we have a perfectly healthy kid of our own to take out the trash. And we had one neighbor who complained to us, who was like in classic Israeli fashion. He's like, he's like, what? You can't double the price. You, you maybe, maybe this week you save five ex- extra cents, maybe next week, 10 more cents. But Double? This is crazy. Why you you can't double? Double? This is crazy. And and we were like uh, that. We stuck to our guns. We're like it's you know we we're still doubling the price. This, this is the new price. And he's like fine, 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 fine. <laughs> he very uh, grudgingly agreed to the new good, price. Uh, good Israeli accent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and um, and so we worked. We worked that for like maybe another month or two months. And then my sister was like, you know, I don't even care about the extra money. This is just too much work. And she decided to quit. And in my mind, I was like, wow, I'm making double the money again. So I kept on doing it, uh, started building up a decent amount of shekels. Uh, I kept them in a big Ziploc bag in my parents' closet. And, um, every day the ice cream truck would come rolling around, you know, singing its little ice cream song. And I would think to myself in my six-year-old mind, I'd be like, oh, my parents never buy me ice cream, but I could buy myself ice cream because I've got money. And so I'd go and get get some money and buy myself an ice cream and pretty much bought myself an ice cream every day um, because I loved ice cream, as all six-year-olds do. And uh, I remember my aunt visited me from the United States and she like, like she hadn't seen me in a bit. And she's like, ah, oh, you're gaining a little bit of weight. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it was too much ice cream. Um, and then I turned seven and for my birthday, my dad bought me this, this, uh, this uh, styrofoam airplane, which had like a, like a rubber band powered propeller. You would wind it up and the propeller would spin and you'd throw it. And my older brother, who's three years older than me, so he was about 10, uh, he, uh, he wanted to play with it. And I said, okay, you can play with my birthday present, but if you break it, you have to pay me back for it. And he said, I promise you, if I break it, I'll pay you back for it. And of course, on the first throw, it promptly broke into pieces. It was a piece of crap, you know, it was a styrofoam, very weak, but, um, he, so <laughs> he, of course he had no way to pay me back. And so my dad said, well, you could take over his job and earn money to pay him back that way. And so he took over my job and it took him like a good month and a half to, to earn enough money to buy this airplane again. And I decided at that point, I didn't even really want the airplane. I just took the money and ended up spending (laughs) it on ice cream, but I had a decent amount of money saved up and I was already used to not doing the job anymore because my brother had been doing it for like the last month and a half. And so I decided not to continue, uh, the work and that's how that business ended. So that was my first entrepreneurial venture. Yeah. Um, I mean, it it sounds like that might've had like a knock on effect in the rest of your life. Like you were taught about business structure and you were taught about like, yeah, Yeah, like being the the head of the business and and like looking at all the parts of it from a young age. Yeah. And negotiating and and pricing and yeah, uh, yeah, I I learned uh, a lot of lessons. Yeah. Absolutely. Even like uh, distributing the work off to other people, like your yes, brother, for instance. In that's that true. Yeah, I mean, it was it was more my it was all my dad's idea, of course. But uh, but yeah, I learned a lot of very valuable life lessons from that for sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and ever since then, I've been I've always been um, somewhat entrepreneurial. Um, in uh, as as so the way I got into the whole bedsheet business, which they talk about in the movie, is actually. Um, uh, at the time, this was like in the early two thousands, uh, digital cameras were becoming a thing. There was the big shift from, from, uh, from film to digital cameras. And so I bought myself a digital camera and 
uh, I realized one of the biggest expenses as part of buying a digital camera was the SD card. The SD card, which held you know held all the all the pictures, the the memory on it, um, they were pretty expensive at the time, and I just couldn't bring myself to spending almost as much on the SD card as I did on the camera. So I kept on looking for a better price. Eventually, I found a manufacturer in China that makes SD cards, but they would only sell me a hundred. They wouldn't sell me one. So I figured, well, the price is really good. I could probably resell the rest of them on eBay and make some money. So I bought a hundred of them. I resold them pretty quickly on eBay and then started buying more of them. And then it became like a regular business. I started doing pretty well with it. Uh, told one of my friends, uh, you know, about the business and he was like, Oh, you know, I'm actually, uh, recently started a, uh, a, uh, like a nursing home equipment distribution business where, because his dad owned a nursing home and, uh, and his dad would buy all this various equipment like bed sheets, towels, and, uh, patient gowns, uh, various medical equipment, uh, from these distributors. And so he figured, yeah, he'd put his son into business doing this since he's already buying this stuff. So his, so my friend, his son, uh, got into that business of, of supplying nursing homes and not just his dad, but other nursing homes as well. Um, and he told me, oh, you know, I buy all this stuff from distributors who I know buy it overseas. If you can get me a better, you know, I see you already have experience finding manufacturers overseas from the SD cards. If you can get me a better price, uh, than these distributors, I'll be, I'll be happy to buy from you. So I started looking for manufacturers of bed sheets and towels and medical equipment and, uh, eventually found some pretty competitive manufacturers and started selling to him, started selling to some other, um, uh, suppliers. And, uh, that's how I got into the whole bed sheet business. So, Unlike, so this wasn't a complete yeah. failure. Like they portrayed no, in the movie. No, not at all. So in the, in the movie, movie, they were like, yeah. you bought a bunch of bed sheets yeah. and then the first time you tried to offload them, everyone was like, we don't care. No. Yeah. So in the movie, I, in the, they changed it because in the, in the movie, they wanted to show that I was really down on my luck and having a really hard time so that there would be a greater dramatic arc you know, of like where yeah. you start and where you end up, it makes, makes a better story when yeah, you're to like, be honest, it kind of does. You know, not gonna lie. Yeah. Yeah. In real life, I was pretty comfortable. I wasn't like rich or anything like that. I wasn't also in the, in the movie. Amount. They, they depicted you as a licensed massage therapist who would basically yes. just massage rich guys who would try to get you to jerk right. them off. <laughs> so that actually has some truth to it. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's like one scene in the movie yeah. where you like yeah. turn around or something to get something yeah. and the dude, the dude like shifts his towel off and he's like, Oh, sorry, it fell. <laughs> That actually really happened. That yeah, is a true. That is a tr unfortunately a true story. <laughs> was that just uh, a one a one time occurrence? Or was it that... happened. It had like similar things happened a few times, but it wasn't very common. It was mm. uh, so. Yeah, I, I got into massage therapy. I went to massage school uh, when I was twenty years old um, because I was in the I was in college at the time. I was studying chemistry. I've always been like a nerd. So I was studying chemistry and um, I realized I needed to support myself while I was in college because my parents weren't going to support me. And all my friends were working like minimum wage jobs uh, and that did not appeal to me in the least. And mm. I realized that uh, because I had gotten some massage therapy um, sessions because I had been in a car crash, I had hurt my neck. And so I'd gotten some massage therapy sessions and I realized, you know, massage therapists make between 50 and a hundred dollars an hour, uh, depending on where they work, which is a lot more than minimum wage. I could do one hour of massage and make more money than a, my minimum wage friends were making in an entire day. So, uh, I took a little, I took, and massage school to, you need to be licensed to be a massage therapist. Uh, so massage school to, to do the education for the licensing was only six months. So I took a break from going to college, went to massage school, which was an incredible experience. I got a massage every day. I, I gave a massage every day, learned all about the body and, um, was working as a independent private massage therapist. And I grew up in Miami and, uh, in Miami beach, which has a very large gay community. So as a young, uh, you know, relatively handsome man doing massage, I was very popular in the gay community. Um, they tipped very well. Uh, 99% of them were super respectful and I never got 
any issues with them. Um, but occasionally, once in a blue moon, you'd have someone who uh, thought they were particularly handsome and could turn the straight boy gay, and so that they would, you know, they would hit, they would hit on me. But I will say this for the gay community that the second I said no, that was the end of it. Like they were never like, uh, it's not like, unfortunately, a lot of guys with women are very aggressive and they don't take no for an answer. Like the good thing about the gay community is that no means no. And it means it immediately because I mean, it's like men, you know, like, uh, (laughs) you know, it's, there's, there isn't the power imbalance as there is amongst like, you know, heterosexual dynamics. So, uh, the vast majority of them were super, super respectful and I never had any problems, but yeah, that whole towel thing did actually happen to me, but it was a, it was a very rare occurrence. Mm. Cool. So I guess like to, to wrap up what, um, what's sort of like on your agenda now and like what's next, next for singular sound and stuff. So a few things actually, uh, well for singular sound, we're work, we're coming, we're working on a few new products. Um, uh, there's nothing I can really talk about right now because, um, you know, we like to keep things under wraps until they're publicly announced. Um, I will say any, you know, any musicians out there, check out our website, singularsound.com. We've, uh, you know, the beat buddy is an amazing tool that I think every musician should own. Uh, it's, it's good for everyone from, uh, from professional, uh, musicians who just want something as a songwriting tool or something to jam with, uh, to people who singer songwriters and, and, uh, and one man band type of musicians who can't get a drummer to play with. That's a very so common So I think issue. a lot of the people listening yeah. to this podcast are more like electronic music producers right. who, who produce like dubstep or glitch or so stuff like that. Um, right. is it useful right. for those kind of people as well? So it's good. The Beat Buddy is more of a live performance uh, mm. thing. It's uh, it's good for for like songwriting, like as just to have something to work with, you know, uh, because you already have all these ready made beats right out of the box that you could manipulate mm. and play it with. Seems like it would be really um, useful if you're a guitar player for like yeah. prototyping stuff. Quickly. Yes, it is. It is. Uh, we have had uh, um, people who are more in the electric we've had actually drummers who use it because they use it as like a second drum thing that they play along to mm. so they'll like they'll make oh, like, like a the, metronome almost yeah like a like a supercharged metronome that's actually sounds good so they'll like mm. be they'll set the the drum set the drum machine to uh like an electronic drum style and they'll play on their acoustic drums so it's a cool mix um uh, but yeah, but the Beat Buddy does have MIDI so it could sync with your DAW so you are able to do control your DAW and your various recording software with it, uh, as well as record it f- through your computer. Um, the Eros uh, Looper is something that a lot of uh, musicians, uh, electronic musicians as well, have used because it's a very... Um, it's a very uh, uh, easy to use and robust uh, looping uh, pedal. And so are they you can more using it for live performance or more in the production process. So uh, people use the Eros as a songwriting tool as well, but it is intended as a live performance uh, uh, tool. Uh, that is what we designed it, and we particularly designed it to be used hands free, so someone could play their instrument, so they could do a lot of operations with their foot, but there are plenty of musicians, keyboardists who use it with their hands as well. And there's lots of videos out there of, uh, keyboardists and electronic music producers using the arrows. Um, people who have, who use a lot of cables would be interested in our Cably product. It's a pretty much just like a, yeah, just a little plastic wheel that you could wrap your cables around, keeps it nice and neat, allows you to put your cables Mm. away really quick and keeps them from tangling. Very convenient. Um, Yeah, looks cool. Yeah. And, um, so, uh, but as far as, uh, as far as new products, I can't really, uh, can't really talk about it, but it, but there but are, are, they, are they more geared also towards performance and live stuff or are they geared towards production? Would you say? So we are, we are currently working on some plugins. 
uh, cool. which will be yeah much more on the production side. So anyone who wants to keep up with what we're doing can follow us on social media, Singular Sound, uh, on Instagram, YouTube, etc., all the social media platforms. Um, but uh, I actually recently started uh, a new business which, uh, which is, uh, our first, I started this with my brother, um, our first non-music product, mm. which it's, uh, called InstaFloss. And it's the world's first machine that will floss all of your teeth for you in 10 seconds. Oh, wow. it, uses, it uses 12 water jets. You just pass it over your teeth and, uh, very easily, uh, floss all of your teeth, uh, get an easy and effective floss. You go yeah. to instafloss.com to check yeah, it out. I'm looking at it now. This looks yeah. like quite the contraption. I've never yeah. used a water jet flosser before. Yeah. yeah. I use this thing by, uh, it's made by Listerine. It's like this long stick with a flossing uh -huh. on the end of it that you can like, yeah. hold. and yeah. that thing has been awesome. I love that thing. Yeah. So people usually like water picks because they tend to be less painful. Uh, people have, especially people who don't floss very often, um, using string can be can cause their gums to bleed and, and it could be painful. Is it um, weird that I kind of like the pain of the flosser? It's like it like scratches an itch. <laughs> That yeah. I can't get to with my finger, you know. Yeah, it's it is. I would say it's it's unusual because most people hate flossing. Uh, but you are very lucky that you are one of the few people who doesn't hate flossing. Yeah, I um, really enjoy it actually. I also yeah. really enjoy cleaning my ears out with a cotton bud. Oh, I enjoy that too. That's that's that that's something. Especially you're, like actually, if you if yeah. you do it like with the syringe full of hot water, I love it. Oh yeah. So you're actually supposedly not supposed to put a cotton swab inside your ear because you could I've damage heard this, your ear. Because it can, it can yeah. also compress yeah. the wax in. You, yes, yeah, I think exactly. You're, su you're supposed to plunge with yeah. water and flush yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah. That's that is the official way that you're supposed to do it. Yes, I agree. But yeah, I still do cotton swabs just because it kind of feels good. Mm. Um, also, like but, you got to. I feel like if I don't dry the inside of my ear, I just feel weird. Yeah, I hear like, exact same. Yeah. When I take a shower, I always yeah, yeah. use it to dry the inside of my ear. Yeah, I'm the same. So yeah, so we are. So we just uh, launched InstaFloss. We've uh, been working on it actually for five years, and and we just delivered the first units to uh, to customers uh, literally a few weeks ago. So uh, anyone who wants to check that out, InstaFloss.com, kind of like Instagram but flossing. InstaFloss. Where, where do you get these? Um, like this is yeah. another crazy business idea like what made you think yeah. of, i know we're trying to wrap up but like what, what yeah. made you think of this and why did you start yeah. to why did you decide to make this so um one thing so i, I started uh, singular sound with with one of my brothers i'm um, i'm one of nine children but i way. read that on your wikipedia yeah. page oh, yeah. that's wild yeah uh, orthodox jewish families they tend to have big families so um I, I started in a singular sound with one of my brothers and one of the, th and we've been building the business since 2013. Same brother um, that broke your plane? No, that's my older brother. This is one okay. of my younger brothers. <laughs> nice. Actually. So out of my, uh, out of, uh, the nine siblings, five of us are working in my company. So it's mm. a real oh, wow. family business. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. But, uh, the one that broke my plane, he's not one of them. He actually, yeah. um, He's a software developer who uh, works for Verizon. Um, well, Smart, he probably yeah. makes a lot of money. <laughs> he he does well. He does well. Um, so um, anyway, uh, uh, my, one of the things I was talking about with with the brother I started Singular Sound with was that we always would have this conversation where. Um, so okay, so I'll tell you. I'll tell you the story of how this kind of thing started. Um, every year we go to Nam right which oh, uh, for those who yeah yeah, yeah. for like those who don't know through a fire hose <laughs> yeah that's exactly, for real exactly for people who don't know it's i think the world's biggest musical instruments exhibition yeah uh, basically for yeah. anyone who hasn't been if you yeah. like going into like say micro center or like a music store just to like look at the shit that they have yeah you love yeah. them it's like every it's like the biggest music store ever yeah yeah it's it's, it's, it's every an, company like yeah it's like a giant pissing exactly. contest for all the biggest <laughs> tech, exactly. tech music companies just yeah. trying to like show that's, off their yeah cool thing. that's that's the well 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 put yeah it's exactly what it is it's pretty much every major music company and mo most of the minor ones as well so I are assume there, you have a booster yeah. now probably right 
we we had a booth every year until last year and then we decided last year to try it without a booth and that worked for us so so this year this coming year what we're going to do is we're going to have our equipment displayed at kind of like um at, at what the, i think it's called the pedal deli where uh it's uh, like one booth where a lot of manufacturers just display their pedals and you like there's like little mini booths so that's what we're going to do so people can come and check out our gear uh at that booth but we are mainly going to be there just to meet with um distributors and and uh journalists and things of that nature so we're not exhibiting this year just because exhibiting is just such a massive pain in the butt and it's very expensive and we realize that we it's just not worth the money and the and the hassle um at least for now. I mean, we'll see how the industry changes. I, I think that that COVID really kind of threw a wrench into that whole industry, the whole exhibition. Well, it's taught, it also, I yeah. think, taught everybody new ways of doing things. Like exactly. There's a, there's a study exactly that, I've, right. that yeah. I read about where yeah. a bunch of people uh, were, were told you need to find a new way to get to work. And yeah. out of that study, like ninety yeah. percent of them who found the new way to get to work after they were after the study, and they were told you can go back to your yeah. regular way of getting to work, yeah. now stuck with the new way because they yeah. found a better way to get there. Exactly. So yeah. I think it's like COVID yeah. had that effect on a lot of uh, businesses that were like there was just this sort of like status quo or like standardized mm-hmm. way of doing things, and through COVID, everyone had to figure yeah. out their own new way of doing things. That's and right. I think a lot of people realized that it's better to do it that way. Yeah. Uh, exactly. People were knocked out of their habits. And so we were in the habit of exhibiting every year <laughs> as were a lot of other companies. And, uh, then NAM got canceled for like, like two years. And so we had to do everything online and we realized, you know, we could just do everything online. And, uh, so we decided not to exhibit and it's still, you know, went well and uh so that's kind of what we're doing now still probably beneficial of you to have exhibited there a few times yeah oh for sure especially in the beginning i mean when you're just starting a company and you really need as much uh connections and exposure as you can get that it's still very much worth it but we already pretty much have all our relationships established in the industry with our, our distribution partners and and uh, we have connections with all the journalists and who write about this stuff and so it, it's diminishing rates of return uh for us uh as far as that goes but you know i'm not saying we'll never exhibit again uh we'll see how the how the industry moves and and we'll, we'll see if it's worth it um so what does nam have to do with this water yeah, flosser right good good question good question i was getting there we were going down another sidetrack um, so NAM every year has guest speakers and, uh, one, uh, one year it had, uh, Steve Wozniak, who's the co-founder of Apple, uh, was the guest speaker. And one of the things he said, and this was to a very big packed crowded room, he said during his speech, he's like, you know, in the beginning in Apple's early days, we really focus on the artist, on the musician, um, because, you know, and, and, and we really focused on, on making software that works for them. And then eventually we realized that we could pivot, that we should probably pivot to the more general consumer electronics market because it's just much bigger <laughs> and Makes everyone, sense, yeah. and everyone laughed, but it was a very painful laugh. <laughs> mm. Because he's talking to the people who are selling to the musicians and he's telling them, yeah, you know, it is a much smaller industry. There's only at most 10% of people would consider themselves musicians. Um, and you're, you're really and, and limiting the amount of people you can sell exactly, to. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, everybody has teeth. Exactly. <laughs> and in fact, our corporate name for the Instafloss it's, uh, is EHT Inc. And it stands for Everybody Has Teeth. Yeah, nice. Inc. <laughs> <laughs> and so ever since that speech by Steve Wozniak, uh, my brother and I were like, we have to come up with a product that the general market can use, not just musicians. Mm. And so we're always kind of on the lookout for something like that. And then one day we were hanging out in my, in my house and we were eating some mango. And of course, mango has these fibers that get stuck in your teeth. Mm. And so we went to my bathroom to floss to get rid of the fibers. And I was like, I told my brother, you know, we're like both flossing in my bathroom. And I tell my brother, I'm like, you know, flossing is such a pain in the butt. I really wish we could have a machine that could just floss our teeth for us. 
And he's like, oh, if we could create something like that, that would sell like crazy. And so we we're like, okay, well, let's see if we could come up with something. And we just started brainstorming and we came up with a whole bunch of wacky stuff that would have never worked. And eventually we, after quite a while of brainstorming, we came up with the uh, design for the InstaFloss, which what you can was see the, on our like, website. What was the craziest idea that you came up with that would have uh, never worked? Yeah, it, it, in um, AI controlled robotic hands that use string to <laughs> floss your teeth for you, you know. I mean, like maybe it, it could have worked eventually, but definitely not these days. Would have been days. really expensive yeah. to produce. Extremely would have been extremely, extremely expensive. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. you couldn't travel with it or anything. It would have been a disaster. Uh, we probably never would have built it, and even if you know, to, to a functional degree, and even if we did build it it probably would have been too expensive for anyone to buy. So that's why we never really like attempted. like research groups to like get on the one that you have now? Like how did you, yeah. what was so the process? We, yeah, so we, te- well, we have, it took us three years, but eventually we built a working prototype of the design that we have now. And then we tested it on a bunch of people and tried it and see, and we also, we tested on someone who'd never flossed never flosses in general, someone who flosses regularly with string, someone who's, uh, who uses a water pick. So we did all these tests on different people who are in different profiles of flossing, so to speak. And, uh, and it's, it's very effective. It's actually more effective than string. Um, because the it, water flossers, if used properly, can be more effective than string because the water gets under the gum line. And it washes mm. out the bacteria that's under the gum line, which string does not do. There right. are certain cases where you need string that water floss won't work. Like there, if something is stuck really hard in mm. between your teeth, sometimes water flossing can't get it out. So they do recommend that you still, you, even if you do use water flossers, you should still use string floss every like two to three weeks at least, um, just just for the stuff that gets really tough in there. But as a general day-to-day thing, water flossing is actually more effective than string if used properly. And that's a big caveat because a lot of people who use water flossers uh, don't use them properly. They, they w- The way you use a water flosser properly is you have to point the water jet at a 90 degree angle to the gum line and you need to trace the gum line, mm-hmm. right? And you need to do this both on the outside and on the inside, right? So, uh, and if you don't do a 90 degree angle, like if you're pointing up into the gum line, then you irritate the gums and cause it to become inflamed. And if you point downwards away from the gum line, then you're not getting a, a proper full cleaning. So you do need to have the angle be at a 90 degrees and in particularly on the inside of the mouth pointing outwards, it's very difficult to maintain that angle, uh, without, practicing quite a bit so it's got quite a learning curve for a regular right, water this flosser one, it seems like there is exactly. no possible way to get it on other than 90 degrees because you exactly like bite onto it at a 90 yes. degree angle exactly so it's it's uh it's easy to uh to do you know there's no training and practice required with the insta floss mm. uh because of the way it's built it gives you a perfect floss every time even if you are not uh, you know, if you don't haven't acquired any skills for it, cause it's no skill required. Yeah. So that's, that's why we came up with this idea. We realized that the science was already out there for water flossing. So we knew it was scientifically proven to be effective. And the pain point of regular water flossers is the skill and time that it takes to do properly. When this, and InstaFloss solves both of those things. It, it mm. gives you a perfect floss without having to learn the skill of implementing it. And because it's using 12 water jets instead of one, it does all four quadrants of your, of your mouth, the top, bottom, inside, and outside uh, all at once. So you could do the entire floss in 10 seconds instead of like one to two minutes, which it would take with a water flosser. So it's faster and easier. Yeah, genius. Yeah, it sounds like you're very yeah. good at finding gaps in the market and yeah. fulfilling yeah, yeah. those gaps and in a very like a uh, kind of realistic way. Yeah, I, I pretty much my processes. I a pragmatic think pragmatic way. I guess is the word. Yeah, I was for. yeah, yeah. I the, the, my processes. I think well, you know, if I encounter something that annoys me in life, <laughs> mm. I think is there anything out there that can fix this? And if there isn't. I'm like, can I imagine something that can fix this if it existed, right? And if that thing that I imagine I strongly believe can fix this problem and there's nothing else out there, and I think that this thing that I imagine can be built in a way that 
will be effective and affordable, then it's got potential. Then I, you know, then, then I, then I look into it deeply. I actually have a spreadsheet where I have like 30 different ideas of various products and businesses that, uh, that I've thought of that are just waiting to be worked on. But, uh, but I have a whole bunch of other things that I'm working on now, so I can't do everything. Actually got to balance, uh, uh, you got to balance the, the passion with the money. For sure. I Absolutely. Like the I mean, same exists in what I yeah. do as well. It's like I got to balance yeah. the music that I actually want to make with the music that people are going to enjoy. Exactly. I mean, we only have, we only have certain, well, we all have 24 hours in a day mm. and you have to choose what's the best use of your time. And so you can't do everything just physically impossible. Um, I am actually, uh, um, oh, so for people who want to check out Instafloss, go to instafloss.com. You could buy one if you like, they're ready to ship right now. Um, uh, but I am also currently working on a brand new business, another one, uh, that is completely uh, different. Uh, so one thing that I've had is, um, uh, since the movie came out, uh, a lot of people have asked me about tips and, you know, to coach them on how to start a similar business, uh, to do government contracting, to sell to the government. And of course I haven't, I've been legally barred from doing business with the government since, uh, 2011. Uh, that actually, that bar, that, that limitation recently expired. So I am legally allowed to do it again. And even with that limitation, does that extend to helping people who are helping the government? It does not. So okay. it's, yeah, you can help people, you can teach people, but you just can't be part of the business. But even that has expired now. So people have always been asking me to, uh, to teach them how to do this. Um, and, and I usually have this like a uh, copy paste answer. I send people, people contact me on Instagram or other social media platforms and, and they're like, please, you know, teach me. I'm desperate. Just like you were in the movie, I hard down on my luck. And I, you know, I'll work for free. I'll give you a cut, et cetera, et cetera. And I have, pretty busy. I've got lots of businesses I'm working on. I really have no interest in, in, uh, in becoming somebody's mentor, um, it, you know, in this, in this kind of case. So, uh, but then I, one day I had someone who contacted me and, um, unlike everyone else, they said, you know, me and my partner, me and my best friend just want you, just want you to know that about f- three, four years ago, we saw war dogs and we were so inspired that we decided to try to do it ourselves and it was very difficult and it took us like a good year to finally get the business going but nowadays we have a successful government contracting business and we specialize in laundry services of all things you know they tried to because the government buys everything not just weapons and ammunition right. they the us the federal government is the biggest single uh uh, um, customer in the world. I mean, right. it's, um, uh, has more money to spend than pretty much everyone else. Right. They have um, a lot of agendas and a lot of different exactly. shit that they want to uh, be doing. They're, they're doing a lot of things. And, uh, and I think the, uh, the defense department budgets alone is like $800 billion. Right. And that's I mean, more they, than the, they even need instruments, right? For like the bands <laughs> they do. and shit in the army. That's right. They do. They, they literally buy everything. They buy yeah. everything from clothing to food, to musical instruments, to weapons, to nuclear bombs and jet fighters. I mean, they buy everything. Um, and they have a process, a procurement process where they list what they want on their website, sam.gov. You can go check it out if you're curious, sam.gov gov um and you can search for things that they're buying now the the problem with dealing with the federal government is that being that since they're a government they're a big pain in the butt to deal with and they have a lot of rules and a lot of paperwork and it's very dry and boring and complicated and it takes you know some a lot of effort to uh to figure out the system and until you can actually sell to them so um so i had the idea these guys that who were built a successful government contracting business they're currently running this business uh and uh you know i have this awesome story so we decided to partner up and create war dogs academy Mm, interesting. And it's going to be a complete end-to-end course of teaching people how to do government contracting. 
Uh, and um, not only that, but we're going to have a, an option for people to join a community. Like we're going to have a, a forum where people can make can network and make connections with each other. We also have investors who are interested in investing into the um, into people's contracts that they win. So one big thing, one big limitation for doing government contracting is that the government only pays you 30 days after you deliver. But your your supplier usually wants to be paid in advance, right. which means you need the money to float that contract. You need to be able to buy the, the goods, pay the transportation company, and then wait until the government pays you. And a lot of people starting out don't have that money. So we have connections with investors who are very happy to fund these contracts because a government contract is actually one of the safest contracts that right, an investor yeah, you, can you have. You know that they're almost 100% likely to pay it. Exactly. You know, and that's the biggest risk is whether or not you get paid. And the government is never going to run out of money because they literally print the money. <laughs> right. <laughs> so they're, as long as they are contracted to pay and you deliver on the contract as specified in the contract, uh, you're going to get paid. So we have investors who are very interested in uh, investing into government contracts, and that's going to be part of the um, part of the uh, advantage and, and uh, service that we're going to provide in War Dogs Academy um, for our students. Is the ability is not only are you going to learn how to do it, but you're going to have access to investment to actually perform on the contracts once you win them. And, and as well as connections to various other uh, professional services that you will need, like attorneys and accountants and things mm. of that. For someone who's never been in business before, it's going to be a huge leg up uh, to get into this business, as long as they're willing to put in the quite significant amounts of work that will be required in right. order to make it a successful thing. Uh, I think it's going to be a very big opportunity for a lot of people. Um, so we are currently building this. It's not ready yet. Um, you can go to wardogsacademy.com and put your email in there to sign up for a mailing list. Uh, so we will be announcing it. You could also follow me on Instagram at, at David Packhouse. That's P A C K O U Z. Uh, David Packhouse uh, um, on Instagram. I would say I'm most active on Instagram. Well, I also have an X or Twitter account also, but I don't really use it that much. Uh, but I will be announcing on all my social media platforms when War Dogs Academy is ready. Uh, so that's going to be that's going to be the next uh, business that I launch. Mm, yeah, amazing. Well, hey man, I appreciate you coming on. Um, apologies, I was a little late. And that's okay. Yeah, it was <laughs> really good chatting with you. Super interesting. Likewise, thank and, you. Uh, yeah, um, definitely keep me updated with any of the new things you're doing. It sounds like you're onto a lot of interesting stuff. <laughs> Thank you. I do, I do have quite a few other things that I'm working on that I just uh, can't talk about publicly uh, because, you know, there are various inventions that may or may not have patent protection yet. But, uh, but there, is, there is a whole bunch of other stuff coming down the pipeline. Now, when it comes out is a whole other question because mm. you, uh, there's, you, uh, there's always delays in everything. It's one thing I've learned is that no matter what schedule you think you have, it's always going to be later than what you think. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, but there's a lot of stuff uh, I'm working on. Yeah. Awesome. All right, man. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate the chat and uh, I appreciate it. Have a, thank you. Have a good day. Likewise. It was great talking to you.